My name's Greg, you're watching the Defender Mac Upgrade Guide, and today I wanted to talk about is USB-C worth it for a classic Mac Pro? This is such an easy upgrade as it only requires one thing, and that's a PCIe card such as the Sonnet Technologies USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C card. This is a lot of language to throw at somebody, and we'll get into what all of that means. Next, we're going to use a high-performance USB-C device in order to test if this card's actually worth it. This is going to be the Samsung Portable SSD, the T7. This is such a tiny little guy, and it's only got the one little port on it, and it should get about 1,000 megabytes per second. Yeah, that's not as fast as an internal NVMe, but that's quite fast for external storage. And in order to make sure that we're getting the most out of this little guy, we're going to compare it against the performance of other Macs, such as this MacBook Air. This is the M1. This is the Apple Silicon. It's been tearing up benchmarks left and right. And then we're also going to use a Intel-based Mac. This is the 2017 MacBook Pro. And then once we're all done with that, we'll get into some little bit goofier stuff, such as using USB-C hubs like this one. It has HDMI and a card reader on it. Obviously the HDMI should not work. We'll still try it and then some other stuff. All right, before we get too far into this, we just need to talk about USB 3.0 versus 3.1C as it is a holy cluster f The naming of USB is almost as bad as Microsoft is with its Xboxes, so I'm gonna try and get through this as quick as possible. USB-C does not refer to the bandwidth, it only refers to these guys. So all the types of USB I'm about to talk about can be transmitted over one of these cables or even other types of cables too. USB 3.0 was introduced in 2010, and it was a huge increase over USB 2.0. There's a lot to be said about USB 3.0 over its predecessor USB 2.0, but the biggest takeaways are the increased bandwidth, which is essentially a bi-directional method for transferring data. That means it can send and receive data at the same time, although it's a little more complicated than that. And it has a much better bus system that doesn't use nearly as much CPU bandwidth. Now I'm going to get into why we're talking about this, because it is absolutely bonkers insane when you start talking about the USB naming conventions. It's like someone at the USB consortium is out there to get us all and mess with our heads. In 2013, USB 3.1 was released, and thus USB 3.0 needed to be renamed. It became USB 3.1 Gen 1. Then in 2019, when USB 3.2 was finally released, we had to do the renaming shuffle again. USB 3.1 Gen 1 became USB 3.2 Gen 1. And then anything that was USB 3.1 Gen 2 became USB 3.2 Gen 2. And then the latest and greatest, which was originally going to be called USB 3.2, became USB 3.2 Gen 2 X2. This is also not touching on the USB 4 standard, which is essentially the convergence of Thunderbolt 3 plus USB 3.2. But what the hell do I know? I'm only a UX developer with a concentration in accessibility. So, yeah. The two cards I'm going to focus in on today is the Sun Allegro USB 3.1 two-port USB-C card, which is also a USB 3.2 Gen 2. And the other card is the Sun Allegro USB 3.0 card, which would also be referred to as a USB 3.2 Gen 1 card. Now here's something that not a lot of people realize when buying a USB card. There's a difference between the cheap ones and the high quality ones. Cheaper cards, especially USB 3.0 ones, often use a shared bus. This means all four ports have to share the same bandwidth. In the higher end cards, you usually have more controllers per ports. Either two controllers for four ports or a controller for each port. Over the years, these cards have changed just slightly, mostly in name. They now identify themselves by their USB generation. In the case of Sonnet, they delineate this by using Pro or Non-Pro. The Pro cards have more controllers per port. I'm personally using the Non-Pro Allegro 3.0. 
And they now today offer a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Allegro, which is the same card. I wish I had one of the older Allegro Pros to compare against, but I don't. But at least it's indicative of what most people have in their Mac Pros. As previously mentioned, we're also going to compare against those two laptops. If you've watched some of my other videos, you'll probably notice that I mentioned that the Mac benchmarking scene is kind of crappy. That's still the case, especially when it comes to disk utilities. Blackmagic's benchmarking software is not very robust and only tests one thing, so I'm going to be booting Windows to run better benchmarks. And after we're done benchmarking, we'll get to some dumb USB experiments. For the main battery of tests, we're going to be running this on a Samsung T7 because this is a high bandwidth external 2TB NVMe based SSD. Samsung prints some numbers I just don't think we're going to be seeing. It advertises a read write speed of 1050 megabytes per second over 1000 megabytes per second. As much as I'd love to use commercial software, it's not my budget, so we're going to use the free but loved Crystal Disk Mark. Because Crystal Mark is exceptionally boring to watch, we're just going to skip to the end results. My USB 3.1C card performed exactly about where I expected. 800 megabytes per second continuous reads and very high 700 megabytes writes. In the random read and writes, uh, okay. This is going to be more of a limitation of external storage rather than USB's bandwidth. Comparing my performance to much newer and better computers, the performance is goodish. The random read and writes are kind of disappointing. A USB 3.0 card I didn't expect great performance out of, but man, it got absolutely destroyed, and it also put up some curious benchmarks. The writes across the board are usually faster. The results of this test were surprising, at least to me, because I expected USB 3.0 to put up much better numbers. USB 3.0 has a maximum of 600 megabytes per second. My card, again, only had one controller chipset, and I know that that is the limiting factor. I unplugged all the other USB devices on my card, expecting to see closer to a full duplex mode out of a single port. Instead, it was about a third of what I was hoping to see. So, not 600 megabytes per second, we weren't going to see that in the real world anyways, like USB 3.0 has, but instead, I was hoping to see like 500 megabytes per second. So I suspect most cheap USB cards are going to have this kind of lousy performance per port. If you want the best bandwidth, you're going to have to pay for it. With a card with a controller per port like the Legra Pro, you'll see a lot better performance on a device like the Samsung T7. This is such a performance gap that I'm actually considering upgrading to Allegra Pro because I have so many USB devices on my computer. To make this more interesting, let's pit the performance of a 3.1C equipped classic Mac Pro against more modern computers. Unfortunately, I don't have Windows installed on either of my MacBooks, so we're going to be stuck with Blackmagic's benchmarking software. The silver lining here is we're only trying to figure out if the MacBooks offer way more bandwidth than the classic Mac Pro using a USB 3.1 device. Alright, so which computer do you think is going to be the fastest? First up, we have our old, old-time upgrade champion weighing in at an astonishing 40 pounds is the 2010 aka the 5.1 Mac Pro. Next up is the crowd favorite. This is the slimmer, more agile opponent, even equipped with Thunderbolt 3, the 2017 15-inch MacBook Pro. Lastly, we have the Dark Horse Challenger. This guy's been shaking up the entire industry with its insane benchmarks. It brings serious heat without even needing a fan. It's the 2019 MacBook Air M1. And I might have spoiled it, but if you guessed the MacBook 2017, you were right. In something that shouldn't surprise anyone, the Mac Pro did not win this round. And this is not a limitation of PCIe because it should be able to deliver a maximum of 1500 megabytes per second over that 4X port. So my conclusion is, yes, this card is very much worth it for the performance, but if you're looking for the top tier, you might want to look at the Legro Pro. In a better world, I would have a 2019 Mac Pro to stick this card in to find out if there's really a performance gap between the Mac Pro Classic or if it's just a limitation of this particular card. My gut feeling is that it's the card. I found it very surprising that the MacBook Air performed as badly as it did. 
I expected the 2017 MacBook Pro to win this round because the Intel interface controllers are known as being quite fast. While this is only a single benchmark, it does show some weakness in the M1. Hopefully the next round of Apple Silicon will have much better I.O. For classic Mac Pro owners, there's some peace of mind that you'll be getting about the same performance as the MacBook M1. So what we've learned so far is USB cards that have a controller per port make a huge difference. USB 3.2 Gen 2 is very fast, and you should expect about the same performance as a MacBook M1 when using this Sonnet USB card. The Samsung T7 is very fast. It's much faster than SATA SSDs, but it's not nearly as fast as having an internal NVMe SSD. Now it's time for some USB 3.1C experiments. My strategy here is to plug random stuff into it and see how it performs, from the mundane like USB 3.1C hubs and audio interfaces to the more exotic like other computers and an Oculus Rift. First up, we're going to try USB 3.1C hubs. The card reader and the USB port should work just fine. The HDMI port on these guys? No, but we'll still try it. As expected, the USB 3.1C hubs work. Connecting my Samsung T7 to one of these ports resulted in better benchmarks but a huge speed penalty. This is completely in line with Heads of Technology's review where he gave the same card a 3 out of 5 because he is disappointed in his USB 3.1C hub performance. I think he kind of missed the mark, but he does have a solid point. If you're just using this with 3.1C hubs, you're not going to be that excited by this card. And also to give him a benefit of the doubt, he recorded his video two years ago when this Samsung T7 SSD did not even exist. I'll link his video in the description of this video so you can check it out. The SD port reader worked just fine. I tried three separate USB 3.1C hubs because I have three in my possession, all different makes, and none of them worked with HDMI. Next up, I have the Focusrite Claret. This is a nice device to use because it has USB 3.1C on the device itself. In fact, you're listening to it right now. I'm using USB-C to USB-C and a Shure SM7B. Unsurprisingly, it works perfectly fine. And there's no real latency difference between USB 3.0 and USB 3.1C. This is because latency is almost entirely a function of your buffer size in your audio program. There can be some other factors, but if I start talking about these kind of things, I could easily derail this entire video. Next up was to try and connect two computers via USB 3.1C. Now, I know that USB doesn't have a network protocol, but I thought just maybe. And as expected, it did not work. But since the dawn of Firewire, Mac laptops have had target disk mode. And a fun fact about Firewire, it supports networking, as does Thunderbolt. USB does not. Well, kind of, because USB 4 will be Thunderbolt, and therefore you'll have Thunderbolt networking. And USB supports Ethernet over USB, but that's a whole other thing, not really connecting two computers together. The first thing that I learned is the MacBook M1 Air requires being boot into recovery mode in order to access the target disk mode. But I couldn't get it to mount the disk. This very well could be an OS issue, because I am running Mojave still on my classic Mac Pro. This is an issue I might come back to in another video. Then the second discovery is, yes, you can totally connect two Macs together if one is in target disk mode via USB 3.1C. Of course, you're going to need to know the credentials to get into the computer, and my performance was not very good. I was surprised by that. But without target disk mode, I could not connect my MacBook M1 Air and have it show up via USB. In a cruel twist of irony, USB 3.1C does not support networking, Thunderbolt does, and even Firewire. You could potentially buy two USB 3.1C to Ethernet adapters and plug the Macs in together that way. That's totally dumb, and it's not that I'm above doing that experiment, it's just that I'm not going to spend my own money to do that unless people end up paying me to do dumb experiments like that. For my final experiment, I'm going to plug in my Oculus Quest. For the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the setup piece of this. 
I promise in the future I will do an entire video on the Oculus Quest and the Classic Mac Pro. When I tried this with the Legra USB 3.0 card, I kept getting low bandwidth messages and glitches. After making this video, it's very apparent why, and that's because it kind of sucks for bandwidth. And here's one quick spoiler about the Oculus Quest and the Classic Mac Pro. SteamVR's benchmarks see the Mac Pro as perfectly capable of running VR software. That's because it actually is, believe it or not. The Oculus Quest software, on the other hand, does not. Fortunately, you can bypass the message and play all those wonderfully mediocre VR titles that are available. And here I am plugged in, and it works fine. And this is even going through a USB-C hub because I didn't have a long enough USB-C cable. And for my last trick, I'm connecting my Mac Pro to my iPhone Pro 12, and it works fine. It's not going to fast charge as this card can only deliver 15 watts per port. Anyone familiar with PCIe shouldn't be surprised by this limitation, as to provide more power would require some way to tap into the power supply. Hopefully through this process, you've learned that USB 3.1c works very well over the Mac Pro. I would have loved to perform more dumb USB 3.1c experiments to test the rigors of this card, such as copying files between two NVMe USB 3.1c SSDs. I also debated installing an OS on this SSD and seeing how it performed, but that just seemed like so much work, guys. This is as good a spot as any to start wrapping things up. Hopefully you've learned that USB 3.2 and 3.1 works pretty well on the Classic Mac Pro. If there's any corrections to be had in this video, they'll be in the description. But most importantly, check the definitive Mac Pro upgrade guide as it'll have the latest and greatest and most accurate information. So hopefully if you're looking to upgrade your Mac Pro's USB, this video was at least somewhat enlightening for you. These videos really do take a long time to make. And so far, I'm losing money on these. If you love or hate things in the video, such as my cheesy animations, please do let me know as I'm trying to strike a balance between entertainment and being useful while having a bit of personality. Hey, thanks again for watching the Definitive Mac Upgrade Guide.